I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'll take on to what this lady said. I think that that transition from elementary, middle, middle to high school is challenging for these kids. And maybe that prior grade, like fifth grade, a better understanding of, well, this is really what homework's going to be like in sixth grade, or this is really what homework's going to be like in ninth grade, because it's a I think that's an important point. Thank you for that. So, as to what um, Dr. Hurst was saying, I love that idea. I think kids today, especially, don't have jobs like they used to because school's more demanding and they have more academic um, outside extracurriculars. So, that opportunity to get real world experience. And then also with the engagement with the community, um, I would love to see the district more engaged with the community in general. And then I think at our campuses, the sense of is not what it could be with the specialty programs that are great, but then no one goes to the neighborhood school and those schools really don't build a sense of community and they certainly don't build a um, sense of you know, community with people with families who don't have kids. Thank you for that. And Christine, do you have something to add? Along the lines of what I heard about preparing middle school, you know, we're lucky that we're standards-based grading in elementary. However, the, one of the downfalls is the kids get to sixth grade and they don't know what letter grades are. And so that preparing has been quite a jump for our parents too. So maybe revisiting some of those grading practices at least in grade five. I appreciate that. We know that those transitions are significant, but we also see a dip in grades. So doing some things to shore that up makes a lot of sense. I'd like to see in 10 years we're about ready to start in time that they went through the school district, uh, started in underfunded classrooms, but ended in a fully funded classroom. And that will be true for all students in Arizona. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is important work that we do here, and it is our future. Uh, thank you. I would love to see some kind of a comprehensive media literacy training. Like we all do it piecemeal in our own classes, but that's something broader. Um, I think now more than ever, uh, we need to be teaching our kids responsible use of the internet and what is a good source and what isn't. And um, so, yeah, I love something more comprehensive about that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Also, very timely. And I'll go out on the limb and be that comprehensive health courses mm -hmm. where it doesn't stop in ninth grade and it's not piecemeal. And I would send my student here and know. Thank you. Other things that you would like to see in the next decade. What when we come back from the Hallmark Trust? So this is kind of specific, but in high school, the only way to get the team taught history English is through the ID program. And it would be nice to see AP US history, AP English as a team taught so that the English literature can follow along with the history. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to I would just like to agree with that point as someone in the IP program. It's um, very helpful having that kind of learning with the team history and English. Um, and then also I was just going to point out my grandmother shared with me recently that we only have about half enrollment in SUSD and was that in one newsletter? Yeah, so we're in terms of the number of school students that live in our boundaries, about 55% choose to attend Scottsdale schools. Okay, I would love to see that increase. And I'm assuming since you put that in your newsletter, you would also. Absolutely. Um, and then one other thing, I would love to see more hands on learning in our classrooms. It can be challenging right now with everything going on, but in the future, 
as you can see, more hands-on learning, uh, and maybe learning a little bit more about life skills and teaching more for the future, um, along with teaching about academics. That's a lot of fun to hear that. Well, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going They're still struggling hearing. I quit typing. <laughs> I got those comments. In other words, this was done by bilingual. In 10 years, I would hope that every student is at a minimum bilingual, and if some would understand the best, that would be cool. But the time is access to different cultures, so at a minimum, the rest of these are bilingual. I love that word. Thank you for challenging us to figure out if it was the awful son of the mask or your other language. I figured out after a minute. Very important point, though. Yes, Bob. One area we can look at is vocational plans. I think um, students go through a vocational program where they get certification in. Um, that is what we can set them up forward uh, in, in their career. And after all, I just found on the corner, I think it's a good idea for some of the people's skills at the time. Absolutely. Along those lines, along with that more cultural responsiveness, we did a survey of our staff on some equity and cultural response and preparedness, and the data was overwhelmingly on where some of our gaps are. So, including some of that, those concepts pervasively and not in a one off type of way. Thank you. Our hands here and here. Please join us up here. Lots of lots of room. I would say um, consistent social emotional support with counselors or social workers K 12 for all our schools. Very important. More hands here. So she mentioned life skills a little bit. I would really like to see financial literacy and have that be something that builds through their entire school career. So like junior achievement does, but by the time they get to high school, they really have a deep understanding of how decisions they make in college or in their life about working as credit cards impact their lives. If I may for a second, I am after doing a study on where they get financial yeah. So I'll talk to you after, but that's a great point. Yeah. Other suggestions for what you'd like to see in the next decade? You know, we're not even sure what jobs are going to be down the road in 10, 15, 20 years. And I think it's going to be so important to provide learning opportunities and experiences where kids are presented with, say, a problem and they're and teaching them that it's okay to take that risk and fail and fail and just keep trying to improve it, you know, not to just give up, you know, creating that ability to think critically and take those risks is going to be really important. Good point. Yes. I, I have one that's already been mentioned, but just to honor our folks online is to do more with our um, teach more financial literacy over the next decade. And also, I want to acknowledge the people who are online that our tech team is still working on a solution. I know there's people frustrated. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. So talking about the different types of jobs and nothing against calculus, but we are no longer needing to go to the moon with a slide rule either. So some of the things that they need now, like understanding data, and how those things build together and really looking at math curriculum that's been the same for 50 years and seeing if that's really what the need is in the future. And I understand it's still required for college, but. Other suggestions or thoughts, what you would like to see here in. I, I will add one. I would like to see an intentional curriculum teaches students the soft skills of communication, proper communication, uh, verbally, debate, early on, presentation skills, uh, communication through 
essays, and even in social media. Thank you for that. I think really important. I think we had a hand down here. So along again to build on more of the ideas, the idea of bringing business, businesses, business owners into schools maybe uh, to promote the financial literacy and the and why we do what we do in school, to have that kind of exposure in elementary, but to invite businesses in in middle school to explain what they do and what they do that the students are doing, and then to continue on in high school with the internships to discover new areas of interest, maybe to build on the EVIT program, but just have an awareness what's out there because most of our students will probably become entrepreneurs and they'll need to create the, their business. Other thoughts? So you mentioned communication and I wanted to give credit like I really do think and I think maybe it's common core that does it but compared to what I had when I was in school I think that we do a very good job of giving them oral and verbal opportunities at least that we didn't have you know so many years ago and certainly we can always do more like we made both of our kids take theater not because that's their thing but because that gets you into those public speaking skills and that's much more of a skill you're going to need in life than calculus. So. I'm a math teacher. I like calculus. <laughs> As part of um, the DCMS staff and in our leadership, we just uh, did a survey and one of the things that came up um, is we're not utilizing our community well enough and to find out where those parents and community members expertise lies and to bring them into the school which would fit in exactly with what um, they were saying earlier you know using some of those people that you know a doctor and what he could do uh, a carpenter and what skills he could bring in and using various businesses and parents not only builds the community up but also aids the instruction Thank you for that. Um, I would also like to see the district inspiring lifelong learners and teaching that love for education and learning, encouraging students to ask why behind everything. Um, and I know that the gifted program does an amazing job at this teaching like scholarly attributes and that sort of thing. But I would love to see that everywhere and see it in all of my classes. I appreciate that and love the language you use. We laughed up here because we're in the strategic planning process. You use some of the very words that were discussed earlier this morning. So it resonates um, in, a, in a pretty significant way. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm a teacher at Mountainside, also a proud parent of a sophomore at Desert Mountain and a graduate of Desert Mountain. And um, I'm really proud about how Mountainside has been um, trying to get sustainability into our curriculum and having like the community garden and the areas. We're just like really trying to, I would like to see in the next 10 years, I would love us to be a green school district. So, um, yeah, I just, I, and, and smaller classes too, to like be able to do projects that embrace that type of um, outlook into the future. And we need our students to innovate for the future, you know, so that we have a, a planet to uh, actually, you know, live in, in a healthy way. And we have to have those resources for our future generations. So I think it needs to start with us, with the educators and uh, the families to get on board. Thank you for that. Okay, half serious, half not. I would love in 10 years to have a district filled metaphorically with that young lady up there. Um, 
clearly a very thoughtful thinker. Um, remind me at the end, I want to give you my card because she's. Um, I would also like this would take some type of combination with the legislature because we'd need significant funding, but I would love to have some type of a comprehensive writing program with classes small enough. I mean, just do the math. If you've got 160 kids and you do mm -hmm. one four minute assignment, that's over 10 hours of just grading and kids really need to be writing far more than they do. And that is not the fault of teachers. That is the fault of funding and classes being so large. So smaller class sizes to really be able to really hone in on writing. Thank you for that. Other ideas in terms of the next decade? You've got some online, Dr. Bowman? Yeah, there's a, there's a few online. One's more of an immediate concern. I don't know how this has gone in the past, but one of our parents is just hoping for their daughters to feel safer in the bathrooms. And so I just need to honor what's said online. Um, another one is around uh, communication skills to include writing skills and proper use of grammar and sentence structure from an early age. And then another one is I'd like to see high caliber of teachers who are more engaging with their students. I realize that this year is perhaps not the best representative year, um, but I have a freshman only thinks one of their six teachers is engaging. And so just wanted to engaging teachers. Thank you for sharing that. In 10 years time, I would to see no teacher in this district uh, be forced to have a second job to make ends meet and be able to support a family if they choose to. And no longer what I heard earlier that you have to make a choice to either raise a kid or to educate it. Uh, maybe 10 years is too ambitious, but I think that's a good goal to go for. I think we have to set ambitious goals. If we don't, we will never achieve something that's exceptional. Um, by the way, stop by, see Karen's garden at Mountainside. It is amazing. Um, you know, I would like to see different sites have like collaborative goals. So site councils from feeder schools working together, common goal. So, and also Lisa, maybe bring back Wolfstock. Last year. <laughs> Wolfstock. And we lost. I would like every school to have a sister school in some way across the district or just in order to build a relationship across the district and have kids get out of their own kind of school community. Thank you for that suggestion. Other things you'd like to see in the next decade. Opportunities for improvement, something that hasn't been suggested yet. Personally, as a teacher, I would like SUSD to be the premier schools that all the other teachers want to get in and just can't because everyone, it's paid well, they're respected, and they just love being here. And all the other teachers in different districts are just dying to get in. When in Iowa, where I was, the Scott, the, the Susi schools at that time literally were that premier school. And I would love SUSD to be that because although they are looked upon as a great school district, I want to be the top one. Thank you. Two things. One of the things when we started this conversation about what we're proud of, you know, I've been in this district since I was in kindergarten, so I'm a product of this district. Um, and so I think the pride that many of us, I think we all have in our district because we're generations upon generations of families who choose to live and work and send our kids here. So that's the one thing. But I think the other thing too is doing a better job of communicating the strengths of all of our schools. So for example, at Redfield, and I think all of us can say this about our own schools in a different light. Uh, many people don't know how unique my school is in terms of population or programming to highlight and showcase each individual school, not just to get numbers or to have it be on a Facebook post, for example, but to really truly offer a with the technology we have. I don't see why we couldn't a, um, a comprehensive overview. So it's not just 
myself and my AP, for example, sitting here who bang the horn or bang the drum, if you will, about how great Redfield is, that everyone in the, in the community would know what each school has to offer. Yeah, we heard that theme uh, across all of our town halls so far in terms of improving how we tell our story. Actually, um, Mrs. Bono is my kid's uh, principal at Redfield Rocks, right? So, but I want to say about Redfield, what you're talking about marketing our schools is I think we need to tap into our students, like especially our high school students, because the stuff that they produce, I think is just, incredible and to say that our marketing department are actually students rather than hiring some you know high priced promotion company i'm serious and then you can also say this is a product this is from our desert mountain students produced and directed this video throw it on youtube send it to the news i mean you know have our kids be a part of that process and it's great like on the job learning skills. I agree. Our students can and are capable of doing some pretty amazing things. Dr. Bowman. Yeah, a few from online. One is to ensure that we have writing labs for students to get one-on-one -on -one help and instruction in our schools. Another one is we'd love to see more social emotional learning and more accessibility to mental health professionals in schools. Another one is decrease in testing and more emphasis on outstanding instruction. So, Thank you for that. Now, what you didn't know tonight is that I'm going to ask you to pull your arms out and we're going to start with the AZ merit exam. <laughs> we'll let you out in about two hours. Exactly. I haven't heard anybody say be the best test takers in the world. Because that's not what we're preparing our students for. So what other things? Is there anything we're missing that you want to put on the table? Yes. Um, I'd like to see, I think we do a great job embracing communities and neighborhoods, but I'd also like to feel welcoming to uh, newcomers. There's a lot of people who are transient and move from out of state, and they often hear about great hearts or bases. And we are, it, we are such a tight-knit community that I think the door doesn't always feel open. And I think it would be great to get that feeling across more. Thank you, good suggestion. Have a sense of uh, belonging and welcoming for all in our community and some who live outside our community who choose our schools. Any other thoughts that you have on your mind that we've now put on the table? Okay. Um, hello. So we we haven't talked about sports, and I I would really like to be sure that that's a point of pride first of all, but secondly that that is the best way to build character for so many students, and that if we could continue to model like we talked about the buddies that the you know, that such and such player adopts the player in the eighth grade when they're a senior, et cetera, or even a student that's struggling, that we try to keep that up. And it's hard in a pandemic, but our Wolf Den was starting to do that. And it was just dynamite and it's made a big difference. So sports as leadership and even SEL contributor. Thank you for that. I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Hirsch. I have a few more. Okay. Uh, one is to implement more project-based, collaborative, communicative, and student-led teaching. For example, give them a project and let them figure out possible solutions before teachers provide the answer. Another person says to ask the students about the positives and the negatives of their experiences, listen to how they feel, and make a commitment for improvement. Another person says uh, students, teachers, and administrators should get involved with major community projects and promote them through the community. Thank you, those are good suggestions. Do we have other ones up here? Anyone else with where you'd like to see us in the next decade? 
If not, there'll be other opportunities for people to share uh, your thoughts as we are committed to engaging the community in dialogue. Uh, and that's an iterative process over time. It's how we're approaching strategic planning. But there also might be some things that are on your mind right now in terms of just general questions. How we're ending the school year, what we anticipate for the summer, what we're looking at for next year. Any question is fair game. That's why we invited all the principals so that we can decide who needs to be in the hot seat. <laughs> No, it's, it's open just for a conversation. So if there's any question on your mind, something you'd like to know, now is a really good time to ask. Okay, so this might seem like a little thing, but is it time to open the water fountains? Given the new guidance that now there's much less of a well, the new guidance that we don't think that it's spread by contact, right? Could we open the water fountains? Could we do labs and science? Could PE get back to normal? Those are my big COVID things. So we're, we're making some progress in those areas. Before we open the water fountains, a couple of things have to happen. So we've, we've instead ordered um, bottled water that we're making available so it's readily available for all of our students. As the temperatures go up, we know that hydration is important. As a native Michigander, um, this is a different phenomena. April and May and approaching 100, it's just a different world. So before we open up the water fountains that have been closed, we have to flush out the system, test the water to make sure that it's it's healthy. And so that there's just a process involved there. Um, secondly, when it comes to PE, when outdoors, uh, we've relaxed the masking requirement. Indoors, we haven't done that yet. We're continuing to consult with public health officials, but we recognize that the combination of heat, mask, and activity make it really, really difficult. Uh, and in terms of science labs, I think we've started doing that in some places. I don't know that everyone's done it, but we're doing more of that. Yeah, we, we really want, as, as best we can, we want to continue to incrementally move towards things that feel more normal um, as we end this year with the goal of being able to start as normal as possible in August of 2021. Other questions? There's no bad question. I just have a really simple one to tag on to what she said. Um, my daughter is not allowed to pull her mask down to have a drink of water in the classroom. She has to leave the class. And so she won't drink water because she doesn't want to miss instruction time. Hmm. We have that problem too. Seventh grade. And the teachers will, they get to pull theirs down and have a drink. But if they can go to lunch together, why can't we at least relax that standard? I'm, I'm glad you brought that question up. We have our meeting tomorrow with our ICS team that has conversations about um, issues and challenges, so we can bring that one up with the team tomorrow. It's the first time that I heard that specifically. Uh, I would just like to comment on that. I think it might depend on the teacher and maybe even the school, but I know personally a lot of my teachers are more like uh, relaxed about that, so it could just be, yeah. Yeah, yeah she's at Desert Canyon Middle School, and all of her teachers have that policy. My husband's a first year teacher in another district here, and he gives his students mask breaks. And a lot of the students have anxiety, and with the mask and the heat, she has trouble with that as well. But anytime a student pulls it down, they get chastised. Right, and we are working on how to ensure consistency across our buildings. And the truth is, this is and has been one of the most difficult years anyone's had to navigate. And we don't know what we don't know. And what we thought we knew back in August is different now than it was then. And we continue to learn more information. So we try to adapt on the fly. Um, it's, it's a challenge. I'm, as much as I love this school year, I cannot wait for May 27th. <laughs> I don't disagree with anything you say, but in the same breath as a teacher and at Desert Canyon Middle School, um, you, you have to think about the other side. We have just about as many parents calling saying, so-and-so's mask is down, you know, what are you gonna do about it? So it's, it's kind of one of those balancing acts until we get theory of what is protocol, but I respect it because I, I fully understand that. And that's why if my kids were in my classroom, I don't 
do that. I walk outside or I take it at break time too, but hopefully we can agree that it's not a great situation no matter what and try to see each other's perspectives because we do hear it on the other side too. And, and that ha is what has made this year particularly challenging because there are such strong opinions on both sides. Our teachers have been put in the middle of the conversation, our principals, um, and it's it's difficult. And parents, you know, have had differences of opinion. And at the end of the day, what I think we can all agree on is we're trying to do the very best we can for our students who are, are also subject to all of the challenges of the pandemic, but without the same level of ability to process or understand why this is all happening the way it's happening. Um, I actually feel pretty proud of how Scottsdale has navigated this. I won't say it's perfect, but we've been able to have students in person for the families who want to need it. We've been able to have online for those who want to need it. And we didn't have any major disruptions um, to speak of, and, and it wasn't like what I read in some other schools. So I, I want to give a shout out to our teachers and to our staff, to our families that stuck with us, because I think it's not been easy, uh, but the end is in sight. 42 calendar days, but I'm, again, not counting. Um, we're almost there. Other questions? Dr. Menzel, I have a few comments. I'd say just to generalize them, mask inconsistency is a little bit of a theme that's emerging without reading every one of those individually. And then uh, I guess the thousand million, hundred million dollar question, what's next year gonna look like? Masks, online, not online? <coughs> Do you have that answer? So the answer to, to next year, you're the first group who's gonna hear this. So we, we can't predict with certainty what next year's gonna look like. So what I will tell you, like I've told everyone else is that my hope and belief is that we're going to be in a very different place in August than we are now. Vaccines will be continuing throughout the next few months and through the course of the summer. Um, and those who aren't vaccinated, many of them are still getting COVID. So the combination of vaccines and people who have natural antibodies are likely to put us near or at the level of herd immunity. That's my hope. Uh, I would prefer, strongly prefer not to have to wear masks. Um, it's, I, I know why we do it, and I support following the guidance of public health officials, but I'm tired of wearing a mask, and so I'll be honest about that. I hope we don't have to. Um, some of the things that we implemented as COVID mitigation strategies, I hope we don't lose. Um, shockingly, not everybody washed their hands regularly. Um, so this is something that I hope continues after COVID because it does help spread the, stop the spread of infectious disease. So there are some things that we've learned that are important. It's important for kids and staff not to come to school sick because that's how we spread illness. And so there are some things that we've learned that I think should continue in terms of online learning versus in person. Uh, we've made a commitment to our teachers that we're not gonna ask them to do double duty next year. That, that if people and families and students wanna choose online, we'll provide Scottsdale online learning as an option. We'll customize it at the elementary level, building on what we've learned with enhanced distance learning. But we're not gonna ask our teachers to both be responsible for the kids in the classroom and have Dr. Bowman over here telling me what's going on on the computer with the people who are online. Um, it's exhausting uh, beyond uh, all explanation unless you've tried to do it. And so that's our commitment to our teachers. We're still gonna provide the options for families. They can choose in person or online. I don't, I apologize if this was said or earlier before I came in, but one of the things I would love to see in the next decade, uh, seeing as I have a five-year-old, um, is what you said earlier is the consistencies. I think everything with COVID is temporary, so I'm not even concerned with that, but with regard to the certain consistencies while still remaining autonomous, I think that's always been a challenge, but with school choice and promoting the right school for the right student, there are certain things that um, as parents, we expect at a different school and it's completely different. Whether it's homework, the way homework is assigned, policies on homework. And I, I, I personally don't have any idea how you do that, um, especially while keeping autonomy of teachers, but it's something as a parent that becomes very frustrating when you don't know from one teacher to the next or one school to the next, what the policies look like. 
Oh, I, I appreciate that point, and I think that there are some some good analogies. So it, when when you think about teachers as professionals, um, there are going to be a lot of things that they personalize in terms of what's happening in their classroom. But in terms of content standards, what we expect students to know and be able to do, that's got to be certain. So I think about it when you're building a house. You know, you don't you don't get to just make up your own rules and the foundation and putting the walls together and they do an electrical ex inspection and a plumbing inspection for a reason. But when it comes to what color paint you want in the bedroom and what kind of hardware you want on your cabinetry, you know, that that doesn't really impact the, the bones and structure. So you're going to get that combination. We need to have clarity around what kids need to know and be able to do as they progress through the system. And then teachers have some autonomy and flexibility in terms of how they help students get from where they are to mastering that content. And how we communicate that I think is really important for families. Just a, just a quick thanks as a teacher also. I really appreciate what you did to help us all get vaccinated, those of us who wanted to get vaccinated. Um, that was huge. And I just wanted to thank you for the partnership with Honor Health and giving us you know, that, that time frame early on. And it really, really, really me, you know, going back in person. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we kind of stumbled into one on one technology. Uh, that was one of the things that was stepped up real quick. Are we committed to holding on to the one on one technology? And in addition, will teachers be able to have uh, access to students on their laptops as we're kind of piloting? Is that a goal for the next year to have that implemented? So we are committed to one-to-one -one technology. I, I think some things are hard to go back on, and there's there's a lot that technology offers. It's not a silver bullet or a panacea, but it is an amazing tool. And to your point about how teachers can monitor and use uh, and support that, I believe that is in the works, and we've done some piloting this year, and hopefully we'll be able to go to scale next year with that. And my hope is that by use of technology. So while we're not requiring teachers to turn on the camera and do the double duty, my hope is that use of technology helps so that when you have students who are sick or other things, if there's an important part of a lecture, you know, core content that's being discussed, maybe the teacher can record it, the student can watch it later. Maybe there's some other ways we can use technology to make sure that we allow our kids to stay on pace because a lot of times kids don't want to miss school because they're worried about what they're going to have to make up. And if we can think about how we approach that differently, we can create a healthier environment for our students and staff. Other questions? Anything? Dr. Bowman. Sometimes I get challenged multitasking. If you've already answered this, I'm sorry for the repeat. Will we require vaccines for students next year? So I don't know that we can require vaccines for students. It's not a state requirement. Uh, so we, we can do some things to encourage it, but I don't believe that we can require it. And, and in the state of Arizona, we've got an obligation and a responsibility to provide education for every student who lives within our boundaries. Okay, and then this is going back to a little bit earlier. A couple of people commented on sports and to not lose sight of connections with our students with activities and clubs, et cetera. Just the, any of those connections are critically important for the next 10 years. Um, the, another one is around Scottsdale Online specifically, and that's that if we continue with Scottsdale Online to have all classes at once, not three uh, per quarter. So not the what? Not having three classes per quarter, have all six classes. Oh, that's interesting because our students have told us that six at one time was really brutal when we did that the first quarter. So thank you for sharing that. So my kids are long past this, but in the elementary schools, have you ever looked at doing recess before lunch? <laughs> so my kids, like kindergarten for a second, like my little girls didn't even eat. They didn't have time because their little mouths were moving. And you like studies show that recess before lunch makes those kids actually eat more and get more out of the afternoon. So. COVID, but. Um, before we had to modify and get creative with our scheduling, our school only ever did that. So our kids played first, then ate. Um, yeah, and overwhelmingly positive results. So we're hoping to be able to redo that again next year. I don't know, maybe they do it now. Desert Canyon did not do it when my kids were there. 
I, I think schedules sometimes get um, so cemented that making those shifts are tough. But one of the beautiful things about being in a district the size of Scottsdale is we can innovate in pilot projects in different schools, and then we can replicate what we learn that works. And so part of the, the beauty is that we're large enough that we can share what's working and what's not working and tweak as we go. So ideas like that are things that we can have colleagues share with each other and we can build on those. Um, this is a little trivial maybe, but during the summer when it begins to get hotter out, maybe giving those elementary and middle school kids options rather than going outside to stay inside. Because I remember when I um, was in middle school, it would be so hot and we kind of had to go outside. So uh, that's a, again part of my new learning. I get the report with heat indices and different ratings of how long people can be outside. In Michigan, it was wind chill and, and whether or not it was so cold, you couldn't have school. Uh, so it's just a different ball game, but it's the same thing. It's not safe to be outside at certain times of the day uh, with uh, Arizona's hot sun. You know, we have cool room spaces during the, the heat, so students can elect to go to a space that's cool, read a book, just hang out with friends instead of going to recess. Thank you for that. Options are good. Here, Grace. I don't know how this suggestion would fly with um, working parents with young uh, kids, but you just mentioned how hot our summers are, et cetera. I don't know if we can get more parents to uh, choose our schools if we went year round. We still went 180 days a year, but we have vacations throughout the year rather than our brutal two months off in the summer, which our kids are so ready to come back to school because there's nothing to do. So I'm wondering if we would be a better, a more attractive school district if we went year round with the same amount of school days. I don't know if the question's ever been posed to the public. I know that these conversations in other districts end up with a very interesting split when you when you look at making that shift. Bert? I can easily imagine that many families coming back next year are concerned about the learning gap. And we as teachers know that there is no such thing. Um, I would encourage messages that um, emphasize to not only invest in core subjects or to get ready for the test or to get ready for whatever it is, but to invest in arts, to invest in sports, to invest in all kinds of ways, as we say where I teach, make connections to school. Because one of the things that we're going to see next year is that although we're isolated now, forced by COVID, we can be as isolated when we individually force our kids to go learn, 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 because you have something to catch up on. And they still need to make connections. And that, that, that really goes well with all kinds of arts programs, within sports programs, in robotics that I do. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I, I think that message should be clear that we're not trying to catch up and we need to continue to invest in ourselves in the broadest possible manner because that's the kind of well-rounded students that we aim to produce as a school district. Thank you for that suggestion. Other questions or comments? I have a few more. All right, Dr. Bowman. These are going back earlier. One is to begin a student peer mentoring program who interact with other students and are trained as social role models. Uh, in parentheses, circle of friends. In terms of diversity and inclusion, I would like to see more emphasis on the neurodiverse population. Mm -hmm. There's lack of resources, clubs, et cetera, for that community. Um, this is another shout out for writing lab idea. Um, this one's specific, I'm not sure which school, but how can we help students that miss class make up when they are sent home for other children being ill? So I, I will encourage that individual to contact the school um, without knowing which one that is. Um, as a new resident to Arizona, I appreciate the comment about welcoming new students. When we first arrived, the office staff, security, and many teachers have been very welcoming. However, in a COVID year, it's been almost impossible for my already shy son to meet other students. With that said, encouraging learning through groups could have many benefits. Um, not only working in teams, but also learning social skills and meeting others. Focus on the dietary menu offered for school lunches. 
Um, I'd also like to see SUSD go to a more traditional schedule. We start school too early, especially with how hot it is. So I think I'm close to caught up. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. Got a couple other questions and comments, and, and we can stay as long as you want, but we do not have to stay till eight o'clock. That's never been the uh, case so far. <laughs> so two things. One, with now that we have all this technology, has anybody looked at more of, and not every class, but in some classes, a flipped model where they watch the lecture at home and then do the actual work at school where the teacher's there to help them? Because a lot of what I hear is, I'm just taking notes. I'm taking notes from PowerPoints all period. And then the other, um, oh, I forgot my other thing. Go to someone else. And, and yes, we do have people who are implementing a flip model. Brooke, do you want to speak to that a little bit? So at Laguna, we're an elementary school, but we do a flipped model in many of our classes. So it's a learning curve for teachers to learn how and to have the time to actually record their lessons and put them online and kids to get used to doing all of that. Um, but I know SUSD has done some training for the teachers and I'm assuming that that's probably going to continue. Now we've got another back here. Um, I'm sure this has to do a lot with this year and just what's going on right now. But I've noticed in my classes an extreme increase in online and the use of technology, which is a good thing. And I think we should always use technology in our classrooms. But sometimes it gets to the point where we're only on our computers all day, all day long. And I feel like it's not very beneficial for learning. And I would like to see uh, more physical things. Like a lot of my teachers assign stuff online. All the homework is online. I miss like being able to write out my homework, take a packet, turn it into my teacher. And I'm I'm sure that that will increase next year as COVID uh, phases out. But yeah. Yeah, I think we have a lot of concern about the amount of screen time as a result of COVID. The other thing we know in terms of the science is that when you write something, you etch it in your memory in a way that when you type it, it doesn't get firmly planted. And so there's some things that do need to come back that, that uh, were practices before. And again, it's about finding balance. Adelina, I appreciate you saying that. And that's where getting back to Bert with the one-to-one -one devices, we really need a philosophy check-in as a district. And I, I think that'll happen. I'd like to hear more from you about that because in this digital age, I spent two years cultivating no phones and it worked. <laughs> Anybody who's sitting here that knows it worked. It worked so well that a kid came to the office and said, I've been texting my friends and no one's answering me. <laughs> so, you know, from, from her house, because she was trying to have a goodbye party and no one would answer her. So, I mean, that was extraordinary. And now we're back to a, and I think we, we really need to purposefully, purposefully look at what's been the effect on Adelina, who's such a great student, coming back to school. And I do have one really cool story where a very good math teacher here wanted to meet her EDL students. So they came and picked up a math packet. They did it. And then they came back and walked into the school and met her. And she stayed to meet every one of them and see their face. This is early on. And it was just so amazing. This is a high school, you know, not, not little guys. And I think that made a huge difference. And all I wanted to say was, could everybody do that? But we don't, I would like to feel it as a district and give the okay and hear from you. So I could say, well, a student told us to do it. So of course we need to. So keep it up. Any final questions before we wrap up this evening? Couple more and then I'll, 
One quick question on the start times. So the high school starts at seven and the elementary school start at eight. So I would say my high school kids would be much happier uh, sleeping longer and they're able to find their own way to school. And when I was a parent of little kids, it would have been much easier to get them to school and then get to work at seven than it is at 830 or whatever it is. So I know there's other things going on, but I it, think it would be worthwhile to look at changing those so that high school starts later. And I think the kids would be more functioning in their first and second period. So. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Yep, just honoring our online folks. Um, one is echoing an earlier statement about the social emotional to continue to emphasize that, especially in middle school and high school. Whether it's believed that it's the school's responsibility or not, it is without question, it'll become the school's problem. Um, another one is helping students with test taking skills, just the different formats, essays, multiple choice, short answer. Again, trying to find what their strengths and weaknesses are through how we assess. And um, that's it, that's what I have. Thank you, Dr. Bowman. So as we, as we wrap up tonight, uh, there are a couple of things that I wanna say. First, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you have many other things you could have done this evening, uh, and it was even a little cloudy. I mean, the temperature's perfect, but you came here, so I appreciate that. Uh, I also know that one of the things that's the hallmark of a great school is an engaged community. And I believe in Scottsdale, we have that uh, in spades. And so even though we don't always agree on everything all the time, an engaged community, I would take every day of the week over one that's dispassionate and, and disconnected. So I wanna thank you for being here. I wanna encourage you to continue to stay engaged and involved, use Let's Talk or other tools uh, to connect with us. Let us know your ideas, your questions. Um, we, we believe that partnering with our parents and our community and our staff is the only way that our kids are going to achieve their full potential. Um, the sky's the limit in terms of what's possible. So I, again, I want to thank you for coming. If you haven't watched it already, tomorrow is our second showing in partnership with Not My Kid of the first day. It's a pretty powerful documentary in the story of Chris Heron. Uh, there's still time to sign up. You can go on our website and find the link to that. Uh, and if not, I hope that you have a great evening and we'll look forward to continued conversation and uh, a good and successful ending to this school year. Thank you all so much.